Hermanos, tenemos. Más tarde, a lo que en defensa. So we are beginning our presentation next week. So the good news is that we are beginning our representation our presentation next week. Is somebody excited in the house? How to be successful during the presentation is to prepare. How to prepare. Preparation is key to your success during the presentation. That's what it takes. So you can rehearse your presentation a number of times before then. Right? You'll be fine. Remember that. Remember that. The fate and the destiny of your group depends on you and your hands. <laughs> so you have to save them. Okay? Um, it's interesting. All right, so we'll continue with our discussion on an essay on man. When we met, the last time, we were looking at the background issues concerning the poem, especially the, the explosion of knowledge in the neoclassical period because of the decentralization of the education system which allowed more and more people to have access to education. The phenomenon of the mobile library, clash in ideologies. We gave two instances, two instances of such ideologies. As what? As what? You were not informed. <laughs> As what? Phariseeism and what? Nationalism. And we said that these two ideologies challenged traditional notions and beliefs. Especially the existence of God and that the other scientific achievements in astronomy and physics tended to, in the view of Pope, depict man as an ungrateful being who questions why God has created him 
the way it was created and tries to make up for the deficiencies that it sees in God's creation. Pope, in an essay on, on man, views these actions by man as, as um, sinful in the order of pride and rebellion, which, which are among the most um, dreaded sins in Christendom, even in politics. All right? So that explains the that explains the harsh tone. The harsh tone in this poem, and I said that you could read this poem, an essay on man, as what? In juvenilian satire, because of the fact that Pope is not soft on his targets. It's not soft on his targets. So we promised that when we met again, we would um, take some excerpts from the poem and try to explain um, them We're in the context of our discourse. So Pope wants to use this poem to let man see his place in God's creation and to advise man to remain in his station of creation where God put him. Should not try to go out of where God placed him in the order of things so as not to disrupt that order and bring chaos to the universe. Right? Like trying to see what is happening outside space. In the other planet, what's your problem? You were meant to remain on Earth. You were not meant to go to other planets. So why are you trying to fly when you were not given a wing? Those who were given wings were supposed to fly. All right? And so on and so forth. So the poem begins with the following lines. Awake, my son June. Leave all manner, leave all meaner things to low ambition and the pride of kings. So it's as if it is his um, invoking um, his muse. In this case, his friends in June, whom he has been discussing the philosophies depicted in this poem, with after he, re, he was pardoned and he returned to England, um, post his um, escape, his fleeing of England, having been accused of treason. We talked about that in the previous class. So he's asking, the person is asking St. June to leave meaner things to low ambition, things like rebellion, rebelling against authority to low ambition and the pride of kings. Only people who are interested in politics, in the powers of this world, are interested in such things. He asked him that they should look for higher things to talk about, to consider, to give their lives to. In this point, Pope sees the world as a mighty maze, M-A-Z-E, okay? But not without a plan. That means that the world might look chaotic. The world might look chaotic, but there is order in it. A mighty maze. M-A-Z-E. But not without a plan. That means no matter how disorderly the world appears to be, there is order and pattern in it. If you are careful to study, you know, which is why he asked man to make sure he studies only his environment. 
and not outside the environment. Okay, he has no business um, going outside himself to study where he was not placed. In this poem, Pope also wants to vindicate the ways of God to man. Pope also wants to vindicate the ways of God to man. Pope also wants to vindicate the ways of God to man. As we said in the last class, the idea is to let man know that God's ways might not be understood by man because God works differently. That's the idea. And that statement vindicates the ways of God to man is an instance of literary allusion because it alludes to John Milton's um, Paradise Lost that has a similar expression. It alludes to John Milton's Paradise Lost that has a similar <coughs> expression. So in this poem, Pope wants to show man that God works differently from how man thinks and that man ought to understand God's precepts so as to work according to God's plan. And then the poem begins with this very instructive line. And I would like you to write them down. Say first of God above or man below. What can we reason but from what we know? Say first of God above or man below. What can we reason but from what we know? Say first, comma, of God above, comma, or man below. First line. Second line. What can we reason but from what we know? Say first of God above or man below. What can we reason but from what we know? I'll take that again before I explain the lines. First line, say first of God above or man below. What can we reason but from what we know? Okay? The lines... First of all, we can see that the poem is written in um, Mokeroic um, couplets. Eroic couplets. Okay? Which still makes it a Mokepic poem. And you could see the rhyme scheme in below and no. The, the lines are written in iambic pentameter as usual. We take note of that. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the description of the relationship between God and man in the poem. The description of the relationship between God and man in the poem in terms of the hierarchy. In terms of the hierarchy. All right? terms of the hierarchy. Say first of God above or man below. So in that first line you could see 
um, God's positionality in relation to man. One is above and the other is what? Below. Because in this point, Pope is interested in illustrating right, that the universe is in the universe is orderly, is stable and peaceful because it is arranged, it is presented or represented in terms of hierarchical relationship between beings. From the greatest to the lowest. From up to the ground and below the ground. And that everyone is supposed to maintain that station in order to maintain the stability found in the world and in the universe. So anytime there is a disruption in this stability, there's going to be chaos. The servants have to remain in their position as servants if things have to be well. If there will be, it's going to be peace. The masters will remain in their positions as masters. Any time a servant wants to leave his place and become the master, what's going to happen? There's going to be struggle. There's going to be war. There's going to be bloodshed. All right? The same way in the relationship between man and God. If man is not satisfied with his place in the universe and wants to take the place of God, a man is not likely to know peace. I feel like I'm preaching here today. So, everyone is supposed to maintain that station for there to be peace and stability in the universe. So, say first of God above, from man below, what can we reason but from what we know? So, the second line then instructs man, is a way of instructing man to only <coughs> study or put his mind to only things that he knows, things that he's aware of, which is the environment himself, all right? And should not begin to speculate things um, about things that he has never seen, places that he has never been to, and so on and so forth. Then it says, of man, what we see, but is stationed here. Here means the earth, where man was placed by God. So for man, what we see about man is his place in the earth. Is, that is his place of dominion. And he is not supposed to leave the earth to study the solar system. Because that is not where he was placed. Alright? By this time, the science, the scientists of Pope's um, time were very interested in the working of the solar system. As we already talked about, the Galileo, Galileo, Galileo Galileo experiment, all right, that disrupted the, the beliefs of the church that the earth was the center of the universe, and so on and so forth. Through worlds on number, though the God be known, it is us to trace him only in our own. God can be found in any anywhere in the universe, in the sky. Um, outside space. But man's job is to trace God, to discover God where he was placed, not to go out. So let me take that line again. Through though world, through words on number, though the God be known, it is ours to trace him only in our own. Man is supposed to look for God only on earth and not outside the earth. Then say not man's imperfect, heaven in fault. Say rather man's as perfect as ought, his knowledge measure to his state and place. In this line, Pope says that 
God is not at fault, that God is not at fault for creating man the way he made man. That man is not limited in any way. Because man is as perfect as he should be, given his own creation and the possibilities of it surrounding his own creation. Man is perfect. All right? And that his knowledge is measured to his state and place. Man has been given everything necessary to make him survive on the earth. All right? And so, he needs, all he needs is contentment to remain on the earth and try. Any attempt to do otherwise will make him to question um, God as his creator. It is like telling God that he did not create him good enough. He did not give him wings to fly like the birds, whereas man was not created to fly. Okay? Another extract that is important to talk about in the poem is heaven from all creatures hides the book of fate or put the page prescribed the present state. Heaven from all creatures hides the book hides the book of fate or all but the page, sorry, all but the page prescribed the present state. So this statement goes into explaining the earlier statement that God's ways can confound man because God's ways are always different. And so the quote says that man cannot have a comprehensive knowledge of the universe. His, only, his knowledge is only limited to where he has dominion. Because God does not hand over this knowledge to all creatures. Right? He is only given knowledge to a particular uh, point and not beyond that. And it also speaks to, it also speaks to the attempt by man to predict the future, know what will happen to the world in the future, which is one of the scientific uh, scientific quests. Most times in science, you see scientists coming up to say, okay, in one billion years, this is going to happen to the sun, and all of that. I think that this is what. Um, Pope is trying to say that man is not given to know these things. Heaven hides the book of faith from man. Man will not, cannot know what will happen to him or will happen in the future because it is hidden. It is deliberately hidden from him by the supernatural. He is only, man is only shown the page that is relevant to him. So that is what you have in that line. All but the page prescribed their present state. Another except worth explaining is the one that talks about man's attempt to take the place of God as a judge of the universe. It says, snatch from his hands the balance and the rod, rejoice his justice be the God of God. That's the excerpt. Snatch from his hands the balance and the rod, rejoice his justice be the God of God. This is, this is a terrible crime by man because by his, by his action, Pope sees man as indirectly trying to take the place of God as they all are the greatest judge. By taking these scientific steps, man is trying to take, usurp the position of God. Snatch from his hands the balance and the rod. The balance and the rod are symbols of justice. 
symbols of justice. You use the balance to decide who is right and who is wrong and the rod to punish. Rather than um, um, as justice symbols all over the place. We judge his justice. Be the God of God. So mine is trying to be God to God. Mean that he's living his purpose as God's worshipper to even take the place of God, the one to be worshipped. So you can imagine the the magnitude of the of the of man's uh, pride. And when you get to the end of the line, uh, you have, it has exclamation sign on it. I could see that folk is incensed, is angry. When you get to the end of the line, you note the exclamation sign on it, be the God of God. It's that the Pope is not happy. He's angry. About man's attempt to take God's place by virtue of his prideful action. Another excerpt says, in pride, in reasoning pride, our error lies. All quit their sphere and rush into the skies. Pride is aiming at the blessed abodes. So, Pope is saying that all these actions by man to scan the universe, to scan space, is informed by pride, which is a terrible sin in Christendom. All right? All quit their spheres, I mean, all the scientists, intellectuals, are trying to leave space, which are, leave the earth, which, where, they are supposed to, where they are supposed to study, and go to where? Go to space. All right? And says pride is aiming at the blessed abode. It's until now, um, people still believe that people still believe that um, heaven was in the sky, heaven was above that. And that's where God lived. As a traditional belief, most times when people pray, they lift the eyes up to heaven, where they think God is. God is up there in the sky. All right. So that is exactly what. Okay? Yes. So as if they look down, God will not hear. Okay, so they raise their hand and look up to heaven. Because God is there, uh, out there, watching. So it's a traditional belief as to the positionality of God in the scheme of creation. Alright? Yes. So where is God? Heaven. Alright? Where is he in this place? Okay? So are you saying that if you don't lift your hands and raise your head, no. that God will not see you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so pride is aiming at the blessed abode. The blessed abode speaks of heaven, All right, which is up in the sky, All right, and which where we hope to go someday, All right? If we are going to heaven, it has to be that we are going up. All right? If you go down, then that's hell. <laughs> hell is down. All right? Yes. <laughs> because your home is behind the sky. <laughs> so probably it was thought that if the heavens were searched enough, uh, if the sky, the outer space was searched enough, they could discover where heaven is. Yes. But till today, we've not seen heaven up there. Um, although, of course, space is limitless. Space is limitless. So the heaven could still be somewhere that man cannot reach. All right? Yes. But in Pope's time, it couldn't have been far away. They just thought that if they just went up there and search for a while they can see. All right? So heaven might still be in one of those billions of planets 
that we are yet to discover. So don't lose hope. The home might still be here in the sky. All right? <laughs> All right? The home might still be up there, here in the sky. You might know what I mean. So pride, it is out of pride that man searches the sky, searches God, scans the, the sky for God. All right. So Pope then points to the, to the um, seriousness of this action by man. It says, aspiring to be gods if angels fell. Aspiring to be angels, men rebel. One of the most striking and lines in this poem. Aspiring to be gods, if angels fell. Aspiring to be angels, men rebel. You could write that down. At least if you don't quote any other line, you quote this one. But when you're quoting, quote it well. Don't write another poem for us. <coughs> Most of People usually write another point. All right? Apart from what the author has already written, they, they put in other lines. <laughs> right? Aspiring to be gods if angels fell. Aspiring to be angels. Men rebel. You have already started in setting other lines. Aspiring to be gods if angels fell. Aspiring to be angels, men rebel. So this is an instance of biblical allusion. An instance of what? Biblical allusion. And which event does it allude to in the Christian scriptures? Which event does it allude to in the Christian scriptures? Any Christian in the house? <laughs> Aspiring, aspiring to be gods and angels fell, aspiring to be angels, men rebel. Which event in the Bible does it allude to? It's a biblical allusion. It alludes to Lucifer. And his attempt to usurp God's place in heaven, to, uh, his rebellion against God in heaven, which led to his being thrown down with his legions of angels, which is depicted in, graphically depicted in Paradise Lost by John Milton. You read that great epic point. You see the de graphic depiction of the fall of Lucifer. Right? So that's what is depicted in the line. Aspiring to be gods if angels fell. They were thrown down for wanting to take the place of God. And it's the same thing that man is trying to do. So you could see the gravity of the offense. Okay? So aspiring to be angels, men rebel. Because Lucifer's sin was rebellion. So if man is also aspiring to be angels by flying, when angels are supposed to be the ones flying around. And this is what man wants to do. All right? It's already a sin of, re a sin of rebellion as far as hope is concerned. So rebellion, whether it is against God or against constituted authority, is a great sin. All right? Yes. Rebellion rises against God or against political authority on earth is such a great sin. <laughs> Pope accuses man of trying to invert the laws and the order that God has put in the universe. Pope accuses man of trying to invert, turn it upside down the law and order that God had put in the universe, placed in the universe. And one 
informs man of the consequences of such actions. Informs man of the consequences of such actions. And who but wishes to invert the laws of order sins against the eternal cause. The eternal cause is a metaphor for God. Eternal cause. God is the eternal cause in philosophy. The first cause. Right? God is the eternal cause, the first cause. It's a metaphor for God in the poem. And who but in, wishes to invert, I N V E R T, the laws of order, order the way God created the world. The universe has laws and principles that keep it stable in terms of the placement of beings in their proper places. So anybody that wants to obtain that order is asking for what? Asking for trouble. Okay? It's a sin against the eternal cause, which is God. And Pope says, from pride, from pride, our very reasoning springs. Recall rationalism. Right? And the idea that reason separates man from the other animals. Okay, normally, okay, man is an animal, but man sees himself as a higher animal because he has reason, all right? But Pope is saying that this reason that man um, is so happy about stems from pride, all right? This reason that is supposed to make man different from other um, animals is what is actually making him to sin. Okay? So from pride, from pride, a very reasoning spring. In this poem, Pope sees man as, as a microcosm of God's order in nature. That means the order in nature found throughout the universe could be seen even in how man orders his affairs. Because the time in which Pope lived and wrote was also hierarchical. There was, there was, there was this classification of human beings from the highest to the lowest, and I think it still happens today. Even though today we we now look at ourselves more as equal. All right? No one is really, no matter your position, is better than the other. All right? But then it was clearly defined. You know your place. If you're a king, you know, you, you would know your place. If you're a servant, you know your place. And you will not cross. So this order is found in man's affairs. And the same principle operates in the entire universe. All right? From God, the greatest being, to the tiniest insects, to the ones you cannot even see with the naked eye. That's how it is arranged. But even in the sphere of man, you still have this order in master and servant relationship, husband and wife relationship, father and children relationship. One is higher, one is up, and one is below. One is up and one is down. One is above and one is below. All right? So it is seen in the line, the general order, since the whole began, is kept in nature and is kept in man. The general order, since the whole began, is kept in nature 
and is kept in man. All right? So the order of the universe is seen in how nature itself works. Everything is based on laws and hierarchy. And even in man's affairs, we could also see this order. So why should man not recognize this order and maintain its place in its relationship with God and other um, beings in the universe? Right? And here is another important quote which you might want to memorize as well. As students of literature, we do quotes a lot. If you are a student of literature and you do not quote, you cannot quote anything. You need to reassess yourself. Look into your life. <laughs> All right? Think about your life. <laughs> if you are a student of literature and you cannot quote any line, you cannot put even twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> eh? At least you should be able to put twinkle, twinkle, little star to control yourself. <laughs> so you can put something in literature. Right? She's ever unkind to man and man alone. Must he alone whom rational we call? Be pleased with nothing, if not blessed with all. That's another set of lines that you ought to remember in this point. Is everyone unkind to man and man alone? Must he alone, whom rational we call, be pleased with nothing, if not blessed with all? You see the beauty and the aesthetics of those lines. Is everyone unkind to man and man alone? Must he alone, whom rational we call, be pleased with nothing, if not blessed with all? Is heaven unkind to man and man alone? That's a rhetorical question. We want to analyze the excerpt. Then, must he alone, whom rational we call, be pleased with nothing, if not blessed with all. So the whole except is a string of rhetorical question. Right? The whole except is a string of rhetorical question. As, what is rhetorical question? I'm going to ask. Do not deserve an answer. Okay. Question. Ask for its effect, for its poetic effect, and not necessarily meant to be answered. Not a question that does not deserve. All right? You have, to, you have to count your words when you are making a definition. All right? Yes. But it's good, she has tried. Is everyone kind to man and man alone? Must he alone, whom rational we call? Place with nothing. So it appears that if man is the only ungrateful being of all God's creatures, man is the only ungrateful one. Alright? And asking, is it only man that heaven is unkind to? Has not given everything, given hands and given wings at the same time. Alright? Must he alone, whom rational we call. Man calls himself a rational being. Alright? A reasoning being. Which makes him higher than the other. So it calls rationalism to question. Probably is questioning rationalism. That this reasoning is actually making you look like animal. This reason, this reason that actually you think makes you different from the animal is actually making you look like animal. Because animals are wiser. They maintain that position in the scheme of God's creation. And you with reason. You cannot, you cannot recognize uh, um, God's authority and the place and your purpose and place in the world. It's an aberration. It's an abomination. Right? You must see alone whom rational will call the place with nothing in your place. Uh, 
Um, so let's just proceed. So, Pope then asked another question. Why has not man a microscopic eye? For this plain reason, man is not a fly. Why has not man a microscopic eye? For this plain reason, man is not a fly. Saying, why did God not give man the eyes of a microscope? All right? The reason is that man is not a fly. Man, if man were a fly, God would have given him. Yes, definitely. So why has not man a microscopic eye? For this plain reason, man is not a fly. So this also criticizes the tendency by man to, to produce microscopes. So he can use to see things that are not visible to his God-given eye, his natural eye, because of his ungratefulness. So Pope is attacking science in this point, and how science questions, indirectly questions God's creation by trying to go beyond man, man's state of, and being. You were given eyes to see things that are alive, proportional to your state. And now you want to create a microscope so that you can see um, viruses and bacteria and all of that. Okay, things that are so tiny that you cannot be seen with your natural eye. So why has not man a microscopic eye? For this plain reason, man is no fly. Most of the writers, you must understand that most of the writers of the time were suspicious of science and its intentions. Because science came to disrupt religious beliefs, right? They believe in God. Okay? So in the in the end, Pope um, submits that whatever is is right. Whatever is is right. Maintain that whatever is is right. That whatever exists is perfect according to the will of God. In the poem, Pope emphasizes the great chain of being. Pope emphasizes the great chain of being. Pope emphasizes the great chain of being. You can write chain of being as a uh, capital initial, which marks God's creation. And the great chain of being begins from God. In heaven, with the angels, and then the birds in the sky, and then man on earth, and then the other creatures below the earth. So you have them uh, God, nature's ethereal, human, angels, man. How high progressive life may go, around how wide, how deep extend below, vast chain of being which from God began, nature's ethereal, human, angels, man. And it continues like that to animals and those that we can't even see.
So Pope asked man not to question God. So presume not God to scan. That the proper study of mankind is man. <laughs> 